Last week we started our series on uh, uh, disciple on the book of handbook of discipleship, and one of the things that we talked about towards the end was illumination of the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit works to help us to understand God's word. And as we closed out, we asked you to take a look and work on the section on page 15 and 16. That is praying for spiritual understanding. The reason I asked you to work on that on your own, because really this is a, a section that is geared towards personal application. And uh, I hope that was a blessing to you as you, as you looked at that. Before we, before we go any farther, I just wanted to give you an opportunity if there were any questions, comments, or maybe even any testimonies about that section didn't want to give you a chance, didn't want you to avoid giving you a chance to uh, ask those questions or, or just uh, give any testimony about that section. Section on praying for spiritual understanding, page 15 and page 16. Any comments or questions? All right, good. Well, hope, hopefully that was a blessing to you. You, got, you were able to dig into that. Today, we're going to be looking at several, two sections. One is uh, the section entitled, Truth is Greater Than Love. And then we're going to um, go to page 24 and look at the principles of a biblical mandate. Before we go into that, just want to mention page 23 it gives an idea of the chain of transference of truth. Okay, We're not going to actually hit that tonight, but just in, if you want to look through that yourself, the idea there is not that uh, we, get, we establish the truth of our own selves, but the idea is that people who are committed to God's word, pass that truth on to others. And so the, that's what the idea is there. Um, if you have time to look at that on your own, that's great. But we, I know we'll uh, be really pushed for time in order to cover that. We're going to tr cover truth is greater than love. And then we're going to uh, look at uh, several of the views of inspiration tonight. But uh, in starting, the idea on page 17 is it talks about truth being greater than love. The idea there is not that we can set one against the other necessarily. The idea is that truth is what love is established upon. If we have truth, if we have, if we have something that we call love and it's totally uh, based aside from the scriptures, it's not going to be true love. Many times the accusation can be made against those who are trying to apply God's, God's word that they're unloving. And sometimes it can be true, but many times it's because the view of love is skewed because it's not based on scripture. If love is considered just something that makes someone else like us more, or it's something that um, makes the relationship uh, closer, or maybe it's based on totally on feelings, that's not entirely a biblical view of love. God's love is a love that does what's best for the person. It's not just something that, in fact, it's very easy for us to even look at love in a way that, uh, talking from a person to person standpoint, in a way that really is more self-serving than truly serving others. And so true agape love is what we're talking about here. And uh, the idea is that truth establishes the foundation for true biblical love. Now, as we go through this, one, one of the things about this study that's a lot different than many that you'll do is the fact that he's going through systematically through the passages in, uh, that, that cover this, this particular subject. And so it's more challenging. It's more challenging for us to be able to look at those and follow it. It's not given in necessary outline form. We're not necessarily going from the outline and then just trying to support it. What we're doing is we're looking at scriptures, going all the way through scripture about those, those particular subjects and then seeing what it says about it. Do you see the difference between telling us this is what we're going to say and then just supporting it versus here's the scripture, what does it say? And so it's a little different for us, but let's, let's pay attention and, and watch closely as we look at it. I think you'll, you'll get a much better understanding of what true biblical love is and also the importance of truth is as we look at this study. First of all, we're going to look at John 8, verses 31 and 32. I'm going to read that out loud. And Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now the first question in your book is, What did Christ say characterizes a true disciple? What characterizes a true disciple from this passage up here? 
to continue in, in the word, continue in truth. Excellent. That's point A. Point B, what is the only spiritual basis for spiritual freedom? Experiencing truth and doing it. Very good, very good. All right, point two. This is from John 14, 15, second main passage. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If a person claims to love Christ, how must he demonstrate this claim? And there's a couple of verses it says to compare it to. If you look up there, we can see those. It says John 14, 21 through 24. Look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest to myself to him. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Compare those to this verse. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, if a person claims to love Christ, how should he demonstrate this claim? How does he demonstrate his claim of love? Obedience, okay? Um, so what is the measuring stick or thermometer for agape love? Again, it's obedience. And loving Christ will be outwardly expressed through obedience in his will. It will naturally flow from loving him. If we love God, we're going to want to please him, to do what he wants us to do. That's the point of uh, number two, the passage in John 14, 15. Looking at another passage, John 21, 14 through 17. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said again unto him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. Again, verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. This came at a time after Peter had denied Christ. In fact, he met him on the seashore there. And uh, Peter was uh, pretty dejected. And Jesus was working to just restore that relationship and show him um, that he cared for him and, and just wanted to bring him back into a right relationship. Now, Peter had previously claimed that he loved his master more than the other disciples did. Uh, Peter was kind of that kind of a person. He was pretty brash, willing to jump on uh, the horse and, and charge away at whatever was going on. Matthew 26, 33, uh, one, of the, one of the passages uh, he said that, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Yet, when he was there in Pilate's hall, he denied Christ. And Peter, and, and Jesus was here uh, ready to uh, restore him and, and gave him a challenge. And what was the challenge that he gave him to do in order to prove that he loved him? It's a little different than the first one we, we looked at. I'll give you a hint. Feed my sheep. Oh, I guess I won't because I don't know how to. Probably somewhere on the ceiling. Feed my sheep. What is that talking about? What specifically? If, if, okay, if the pastor is going to feed the sheep, what is he doing? He's teaching. Okay, so there's truth that's being brought across. And he's ministering to them. He's trying to also show them and, and you know, bring them to the point where they're uh, in obedience as well, based on that truth. So the idea there is through ministering in truth. That's point A. Compare this with Peter's later appeal to pastors in uh, 1 Peter 5, 2. Look at this. He said, this is what he said later on when he's writing uh, his letter 
to the churches. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Peter's heart was changed to ministering in truth to the flock that God had given to him. Acts 20, 28, it says, uh, uh, we also see in Acts 20, 28, Therefore take, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. There we see Peter as well in Acts 20, 28. Now let's look at Acts 20, verse 26 through 27. This is point four. Okay, so we've seen already that the true disciple is characterized by truth, by obedience, and by ministering to others. Three things, ministering to others in particular, proclaiming the truth to others. Okay, point four, Acts 20, 26 through 27, says this, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the gospel of God. Now, the question is how, is, how is Paul free from the blood of all men in this passage? What has he done to be free from it? He's given them the word of God. He's given them the word of God. Excellent. They, they died, they died on the Excellent. They he had done his duty to share the gospel with them. You know, this is something that's true throughout the whole Bible. We see some passages from the Old Testament, the prophets. Um, it's unbelievable some of the things that they went through. Um, and, and yet they were willing to just share the gospel. Um, here's in Ezekiel. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. This is God speaking unto Ezekiel. A watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. They delivered thy soul, he delivered his soul by sharing the truth with them. It was very important. And uh, there's some more, and it pretty much uh, repeats that in, in some other ways. Jeremiah, uh, Pastor Valiente has been going through Jeremiah. These passages may be familiar, uh, where uh, the men of Ani, Anna, Anathoth, whatever it is, Anathoth, that, seek thy, uh, that sought to kill him, basically told him, don't prophesy in the name of the Lord, or we're going to kill you. And he, at, at a point, really didn't want to. You know, every time he did that, people would mock him and come after him. And, uh, and yet, in verse 9, it said, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more of his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not, let's see, I could not stay. The last word there is cut off on the bottom. The idea is that, that Jeremiah, as well as Ezekiel, realized that this was a, a responsibility that they could only deliver themselves by sharing the truth uh, with, with the people that they were going to. Even those who did not want to hear it, they had to share the truth. Now let's go on uh, to pa page uh, 19. Those of you that have your books, page 19. We're going to look at Romans 6:17. Romans 6:17. Now the church at Rome was a uh, was a very it was a special church. It it had a very unique zeal for the true pattern of teaching of Romans 1:8. And we want to compare that to with what uh, Paul told uh, several of the churches as far as the form of sound words. Romans 6, 17, it says, But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Okay? So he's commending them because they had obeyed the teaching, the truth that was delivered to them. And uh, comparing that to, we're going to just take a few of these uh, passages. Uh, Romans 1, 8, First I thank God for my, through, my, through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Going on to 2 Timothy 1, 13, Holding past the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ. 
Titus 1 9 listen to this idea of sound holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers the idea there was of sound heart sound words sound doctrine that was being taught Paul was commending the, the Romans for holding on to it and he was also uh, telling T Timothy and Titus to make sure that they gave that sound doctrine those sound words that would would be able to uh, challenge people who are doing wrong and challenge God's people to do what's right and so the connection uh, that the question here is what connection could they have with the phenomenal strength to grow and growth of the church of, of Rome what connection did the fact that they held to those sound words have and I think the, the answer would be that they um, because of, of the fact that they were obedient and they were clear in their doctrine their church grew in the way it did and really the church there in Rome um, was a testimony for many years with the catacombs people who refused to uh, give in when when uh, great persecution was brought and even li living underground and all those things just so that they could continue to worship God as they ought to now point six first Corinthians 13 this is a, a favorite passage of, of of many of us first Corinthians 13 it's the it's the passage that deals with love in the Bible in fact, it's maybe the, 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 probably the main passage that we would consider when we thought of the subject of love. And uh, there's several verses that are listed here. And there's a question that goes along with this. It says, if love is greater than the gift of prophecy, verse 2. Okay, it says, although I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could not remove mountains and have not charity, which is agape love, I am nothing. Okay, so it says, if love is greater than the gift of prophecy, and is also greater than faith and hope, in verse 13, you can see that, um, does it follow that love is also greater than truth and doctrine? Would it follow that love is greater than doctrine or truth? What do you think? How many say yes? How many say no? Okay. All of you, those of you say no are looking at the front page and going, okay, he's going to say no, right? Okay. Now, the idea is, that's, that's both of those are very, very important. The idea here, though, is truth, uh, love is based on truth, okay? And in this passage, even in this passage, look at verse 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. That's what love does. It rejoices in the truth, okay? So, it, so really the idea is that Love looks at the truth and rejoices it, in it. Those who love do it in truth. Truth is first. Love is something that's based off that truth. Good. All right, let's go on to Galatians 1. Uh, Galatians 1, 6 through 9. If the, Galatia, the Galatian church was a church that showed a lot of love to, uh, to Paul. And we, could, we can see that in several passages. But here's what he's telling them. He says, if, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, I'm looking at verse 8, unto you that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Those are some pretty strong words. This is to the, the uh, church in Galatians that uh, talked of, uh, that, that it talks of, he, he says in verse 15, I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given, to me, given them to me. Okay, he's saying, this is how much you love me. You would give up your very eyes for my sake. And yet he's warning him with very strong words, don't give up the truth. That's, that's more important, and, and it's something that's very dangerous. He, he says it as well in uh, Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He says that, in verse 110, for now, for, for do I now persuade man, men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul was willing, with the church in Galatians, he was willing to put his relationship with those folks. That was a warm relationship, one that they would pluck out, be willing to give them their own, uh, give them their own eyes, okay, if that's what he needed. He's willing to put that relationship 
on the hot seat in order to tell them what's true and, and, and challenge them to make sure that they're doing what's right. That truth was more important than that relationship. And I think that's sometimes where we get a little bit hung up that with, with the idea of love is we're afraid sometimes to challenge the relationship we have with those that we love by telling them what they need to hear, telling them the truth. So that's the idea of, first, uh, of number seven. The question, first question is, if the Galatians chur church was continuing to show deep and sacrificial love towards the Apostle Paul, how could he threaten their teachers with such a horrible curse? He did that because apparently some teachers may have been teaching false, fa uh, false uh, teaching a false gospel. And the idea I with the Galatian church in particular, it was those that came in and said you have to add things to your salvation, add works to salvation, the Judaizers who said you might have to be circumcised or other things. Now, point B, under point seven, seven B, why did Paul insist on t speaking to them truthfully if it meant losing their warm relationship? And the answer is what? Truth. Um, God, Christ centered, God first living always puts truth first as well. Very good. Now let's look at Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 14. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. In this passage, we're looking at different gifts that God gave to the church. We see in verse 11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Um, and uh, what, are, what do all these have in common as they relate to the believers in the church? What did the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, pastors, and teachers all do? What kinds of ministry are they? edifying. They're all giving truth, aren't they? They're all preaching or teaching, okay? And uh, you know, the question here um, is, what, you know, what's the common characteristic that they give the truth? Now, point B, why is lover not on the list? I'm not willing to say that it's, you know, I mean, because it's not really one of these type of, of uh, uh, gifts that, that he's giving. But the idea is that uh, love, you know, things, love is, is subservient to the truth, okay, that the truth comes first. Now, point C, what is the divine purpose and goal for providing human church leaders? Why does God give human church leaders, people like evangelists and pastors and teachers, why does he give them to the church? To serve, and serve how? For service. A, a, very good. Verse twelve. Verse twelve. Very good. Perfection in truth, right? Because these are our our uh, our teaching ministries. Okay, for perfecting the saints by giving them the truth, edifying the body of Christ. All these things, lifting up the body. Now. What is the divine purpose and goal in providing, okay, we just did that. Ver, uh, point D, what is the great danger of neglecting doctrine? We see that, uh, what would be the danger in neglecting doctrine? If we, were to, if we were to come in church and just have more devotional type things all the time and really didn't get into, dig into doctrine, what would be the danger of that? <coughs> Immaturity, deception, false doctrine, these things that Paul warned against earlier. Very good. And uh, can love guard against that by itself? No, no, love can't. Ephesians 4.15, the next verse. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. I love this passage because it really gives the, the balance between these two things. The question is asked in our book, is love to be the content of our communication with men, or is it rather the most effective way to communicate? Which one do you think it is? Is it the content of our communication, or an effective way of communication? What's that? Okay. 
Any other thoughts? Yes. Okay. There's a balance between these. I would say it this way. It's not only the most effective way, but it's the right way. Okay. The point he's driving towards is the fact that it's effective. If we give truth without love, it's not nearly as, as effective as if we give it from a heart of love. Now, can people always tell, discern that? Can people always discern that? No. But it's not only the most effective way, but it's also the right way. Now, this comes back to when we're ministering. Okay, every one of you has, a, has the responsibility to minister to others in this church body. It's not just the pastors who are supposed to, to uh, minister. And minister not just in the sense of uh, maybe helping someone by holding the door, but at times sharing truth with them. Now, when you do that, when you're sharing truth with others, when you're sharing something, maybe, maybe they're falling down in an area spiritually and you have to challenge them with that. When you go to them, if you go out of something that's just it's bugging you, it's a pet peeve of yours, are we fulfilling what God wants in the way we approach them? It may be something that you're doing wrong and we give the truth. Are we, is that, could that be helpful to them first? Could that be helpful to them? Yes, Nancy. Well, I think, you know, when someone's speaking to you and they may not think that they are speaking in love, but sometimes they know when they are not speaking in love. And that comes across better. You may not think, oh, they're focusing in love, but sometimes the bitterness and the sarcasm, language mm -hmm. of no love at all, that is what slips. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true. That's true. We can see that. We can see it on both sides. Sometimes people interpret even true love sometimes because of what is being said rather than the way it's being said because of what's being said sometimes they take that as being unloving and we can't do anything about that but if we're coming across like like Nancy said is sarcastic or angry then we, we've really um, worked against what God has for us we need to speak the truth in love let's turn the page let's turn the page we're not going to get through all of this here for sure but uh, we're going to try and give you some of this enough so that you can see the balance and the relationship with, between truth and love, not from my words, but from what God's Word says. Philippians 1, 9 through 10 says this, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. The question is asked, in, which, in what ways does Paul qualify his prayer that the love of the Philippians, Philippian church, might abound more and more. Okay, and what should should uh, love of the Philippians abound? In knowledge and all judgment. That's talking about truth, isn't it? Okay, that really, as they show their love, it needs to it needs to abound in the right ways, in in ways that are based on knowledge and judgment from God's word. Very good, Philippians. 1, 14 through 8, just a little bit later in the passage. This passage talks about uh, uh, how, how Paul, we preached through this not too long ago, how, how Paul, when he was preaching the gospel, and others were coming along and preaching the gospel as well, some of them were doing it out of the right heart motive, others were doing it out, out, out of a motive of trying to get a leg up on, against Paul, or maybe they were uh, they were jealous of Paul's uh, apostleship, and so they were preaching not, not with the right heart, but basically to try and have one up on Paul. And this is, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shameful thing, but Paul, here's Paul's reaction to it, which is a little bit strange. He says, what then, notwithstanding, in verse 18, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and therein do I rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now compare that. Think about that, okay, how he's rejoicing that they were preaching Christ. Compare that to this passage which we looked at earlier. That uh, he, uh, verse 9, it says, 8 and 9, it talks about how he is condemning, he's calling them accursed if they preach another gospel. What's the difference here between this and this? Ray. Okay. 
Okay, in this passage, they're teaching the truth. In this passage, they're te teaching false, false doctrine. This one, they're called accursed. This one, again, Philippians. They're preaching the truth, but they're preaching it for a totally wrong motive. And Paul's reaction is totally different. He still says, fine, as long as they're preaching the truth, I'm not going to get offended. Now, was he saying it's great that they're preaching it out of, out of, for the wrong method? He's not saying it's great that they're preaching it for the wrong reason. But he is saying, I'll rejoice that the gospel is going out. So the truth was more important than necessarily love from that standpoint. Now, number 12, 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says this, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. It's talking about traditions. Now, one of the things that we need to be very careful is the kind of traditions that we hang on to. Okay? In fact, look at Colossians 2.8 below that. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. What's the difference between those two? Where are the traditions coming from in verse, tw in, in Second Thessalonians versus Colossians two? Dave. things that men have come up with rather than those that are inspired in, in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Very good, Dave. Very good. So the idea is that there are two different kinds of traditions. One are those that come from men. The other one uh, comes from God, and that's, that's brought through from His Word and through doctrine. Now, there's several questions as we, as we look at uh, this particular thing. What are the traditions referred to? Foundational truths to build lives on. Those are the f ones from 2 Thessalonians 2.15. How about something like the, the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church where they say here's the Bible and here are the traditions and we have to determine, you know, we, we look at both of those and hold them somewhat equal. These traditions basically explain all of the Bible. Is that, would that be fair, Ray? You're a former Catholic. Would that be fair to say that the tradition of the church holds almost equal standing with the Bible? Is that, no, as far as their look at tradition. Would that be fair uh, description of how they look at? Yes. Okay. So the idea would be that, that they take, they have these, uh, you know, they have the things that the Pope said, and all these encyclicals and all these things that they add to it. In fact, they have the Apocrypha as well, and they place that right alongside the Bible, and they call that equal to the Bible. And that's the idea here, that we're not, we're not supposed to listen to the traditions of men. Um, the Jewish, uh, they, they interpret uh, Scripture a lot like that. They have the Talmud and things like that that come along that are almost equal to the Old Testament in belief. So we need to be careful about that, and you certainly have that in cults and other things as well. Point 13, we're going to do two or three more here. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 5. Question will be, what relationship does love have to doctrine in this passage? I'm going to let you read that yourselves, and as soon as you get the answer there, someone raise your hand and we'll... Answer that question. First Timothy one three through five. Where do you see love in this passage? Verse 5, okay. How about truth? Where do you see truth? Pure heart. Okay, look. 
verse 4. What, what words give that idea, Dave? Good, good. And verse 3, you see doctrine, okay? So it tells us there in verses 3 and 4, it, it stresses the importance of doctrine in verse 5 as well of love. Now, what's the, what's the relationship there? Can someone, someone see that? L very good. Love supports true doctrine. Excellent, excellent. Anyone else have any input? Dave. The outflow of it. Very good. Very good. Where do we get the true concept of love? Where, where can, where's the only place we can get a true concept of love? From God's Word. Okay? All the rest of those ideas of love have flaws and, and are self-serving. Two more. 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16. What's the emphasis of verses 13 through 16 in particular? says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee of prophecy, and by laying out of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate on these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and... Uh, can't see the rest of it. 1 Timothy 11, 4. And them that hear thee. That's correct. What's the emphasis there? Doctrine, truth, teaching, thinking about that, verse 15, looking at yourself in light of it in verse 16. And the result is that you'll both save yourself and those that listen to your teaching. Okay? Do you see the importance of truth and, and, and giving it and, and learning it yourself from these passages? I mean, it's, it's in this passage in particular, it's, you know, he's, he's pointing every part of your life. He's saying, here's where you need it, here's where you need it, here's where you need it. The fact that we need the truth in our lives. One more, verse uh, 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in what? Word and doctrine. Why do you think it would be that those who labor in word or doctrine, in particular of the elders of the church, be counted worthy? Why in particular would it be that they're held in higher honor? Yes, Melinda? They have more responsibility. Very good. The responsibility that pastor has when he gets up in front of you every single, every single time he gets up and preaches, I mean, the amount of responsibility he has to take that passage from Scripture, open it up, and not say, here's what I think about it, but here is what God's Word says. Here is the, here's the focus of this passage making sure he gets it right. I mean, the amount of study that goes into it that pastor puts in every week to make sure that not only can he read those words and, and can you know, put three points together, but make sure those three or four or six or two points are the points that God is trying to make, not just the points that he wants, you know, boy, let's, well, we can hit on that now. That's not what he's doing. He's opening that passage up and saying, this is what God is trying to tell us. And that's a tremendous responsibility. And that's why they're worthy of extra honor, those who do that. Now, there's two more pages of that section. You can look at that. Any guess where that's going, though, at this point? I think you can get the gist of it. That as passage after passage after passage, truth is the basis for everything else. Truth is the basis. The relationship between truth and love is that truth establishes tr uh, love. And love is, needs to be part of it, but the most important is truth. Now, we're going to look just for about a few minutes 
at one more section, and that is on page, page 28. And this is entitled Defective Doctrines of Inspiration. I want to go through these because these are some different things. Sometimes people look at, uh, think about inspiration and are thinking some of these in, in the way they're looking at, at scripture. And we want to make sure that we're just guarding against that and at the end, I won't just leave you with the defective doctrines of inspiration. We're going to try and give you, uh, just reiterate re, uh, what the correct doctrine of inspiration is. First of all, he gives the uh, theory of natural inspiration. That's the idea that men who wrote the Bible were great geniuses and did not require any supernatural help. Well, that flies, flies in the face of what uh, the Bible says that holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, okay? That there was, uh, you know, that, that's, that's one defective doctrine. Secondly, dynamic or mystical inspiration. This is the idea that writers were not only geniuses, but also had the Holy Spirit's help. Okay, so that mostly came from them, but the Holy Spirit helped them out a little bit. There's some different variations on that, but that's another uh, defective and uh, uh, wrong doctrine of inspiration. Degree inspiration. This is within the inspired Bible, some parts are more inspired than others. That you can take, this part's much more uh, important, or this part's totally true, this part has a little bit of error in it, and vice versa, that someone can go through and just kind of determine uh, which parts are really inspired and which ones are inspired more than others. Four, partial inspiration. This is somewhat the same. This is, many of these are similar, but this, the idea here is that uh, instead of be inspired more, that some are inspired and some parts aren't, that we just leave some out. Some of them really aren't inspired or they're ju just for uh, uh, whatever purpose. There's two more here that are listed. Concept inspiration. That's the idea or concept that the Bible is inspired, that the concepts of the Bible are inspired but not the words. This is kind of like thought inspiration, that God gave certain thoughts to the writers of Scripture. And then they just kind of worked it out themselves in the way they wrote it. Okay? He didn't, not necessarily the specific words, just the thoughts are inspired. And that's a defective uh, uh, concept of uh, inspiration as well. Then you have uh, Barthinian inspiration. This is, again, part of neo-orthodoxy, the idea that people are trying to work to take true doctrine and mix it with liberalism and come up with a, some kind of a fix where everybody can be happy. And that is that the center of revelation is Jesus Christ, that the Bible stands in the periphery of that circle. Jesus Christ is the Word, so the Bible is just sort of part of that whole thing. Okay, and the Bible isn't necessarily totally uh, all the answer. And, and that, that, that's, that's ridiculous in a sense because you, how do we see Christ other than through His Word? All right? But that's one of the, uh, uh, another defective ins uh, theory of, of inspiration or doctrine of inspiration. Now, what is the true doctrine of inspiration? We talked about it last week, but just want to remind you. The, the do true doctrine of inspiration is that the influence of the Holy Spirit extended beyond just the thoughts to make sure each word is the exact word God wanted to express in the message. Now that does stand against um, slightly the dictation theory, and there are some who hold the dictation theory, and some very good men. That would be that God actually dictated specific words to the authors, that nothing they wrote really came, was influenced, had, had any of them in it. Now I think if you look at scripture, you see that that's, that's uh, Questionable. The idea that Paul wrote wrote uh, wrote letters to the church in his own words, okay, that kind of stands against you know. Then God just said, "Here, write this exact thing." Paul's writing it, but God is guiding every single word that he wrote and making sure it's the exact thing that he wanted for them, uh, for for all of us to have in Scripture, and that's that's really the right doctrine of inspiration. Didn't want, to, you to, didn't want to leave you with all these defective doctrines of inspiration without giving you really what the, what the Bible talks about is the correct doctrine of inspiration.